Welcome. Well, welcome everyone to the um, second annual lecture in archaeology. Um, we're very honored here to have the with Bradley to, uh, to, to talk today. I'm um, just going to say a few words um, and uh, before I hand you over to uh, uh, just a reminder this, this is a kind of annual event and uh, it's jointly hosted by the um, Archaeological Center, the Department of Archaeology, the Society of Archaeologists. Icelandic archaeologists and the yearbook uh, of Icelandic archaeology. So the three of us sponsoring our collaboration in this annual event. Um, and so this year we've got Professor Bradley, who I'm sure many of you know, is one of the most preeminent uh, British prehistorians of the generation. Uh, he's worked extensively all over the British Isles as well as in parts of uh, Western Europe. And written numerous books. I can't even begin to count them, probably around 20 or more, plus hundreds of articles. Um, and of course, his area of expertise is um, it ranges across a, a range of uh, a range of topics from rock art to monuments uh, and votive deposits, um, settling in, of course, a landscape context. Um, and Richard's also, of course, done extensive uh, field work and, and, and been very, I think, productive in forging the links between the uh, the academic and the commercial world in the UK in terms of field work has been such an important um, part of so much of the work that happens in commercial archaeology in the UK is often went into the radio. And it's really good. It came together in my book on the history of the Nile, which has recently come into a second edition. So um, before I hand him over, uh, I just want to make a mention of a few things. This talk will be recorded, uh, but we'll stop uh, at the end for discussion. So that we'll be switched off during the discussion. There'll be questions afterwards, time for questions. And then when uh, when that's complete, we'll, everyone's invited to, to go to the uh, student bar for drinks and have a more than informed chat, to ask further questions or, or whatever. So thank you, and uh, over to you, Richard. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is somewhere I've always wanted to be. And to my shame, I've been retired for some years and it's the very first time I've, I've got as far as Iceland. And I've had a great time so far and I hope I won't let things down in the next hour or so. Let me uh, start by explaining the, the scope of this talk. There are really two ways in which I could give it. One uh, is, basically rather similar to the poster, to explain some theoretical and interpretive ideas and then to illustrate them. I did to a toy with this, but it did seem to me that it was actually dishonest it, in terms of my own experience, because the projects I'm describing were almost always undertaken within a, more, within a different framework. And what I'm saying today, what I'm talking about today, are the things that surprised us, the things that did not fit that conventional framework. So I want to trace that process of realising that the archaeology, the field archaeology of Northern Britain is just much stranger than I believed it to be. Not just because every radiocarbon date I get is about a millennium different from what I'd expected, but that the sites themselves became stranger and stranger as we worked on them. And it's only in retrospect that I felt we could talk about what I'm calling found architecture. Now, found architecture, um, by analogy with uh, objet trouvé in modernist art, found objects. This is a collage by Kurt Schwitters. Um, and it took me back really further back than I wanted to think, to a book I wrote, I think it was, well, the best part of a quarter of a century ago, about what were then called natural places. Well, I wouldn't call it that now, because I think we've all begun to feel very unhappy with a, a distinction, a linguistic distinction between culture and nature. But at the same time, it, the process of field work did make us alert to a whole series of phenomena in field archaeology and in landscape archaeology, which did not fit. They weren't monuments. They were places that were treated as if they were monuments, or they were places that became monuments. And I want to explore that rather difficult ground. And then at the end, I shall do two things. I shall try to make some generalizations about what their common features might be. I slightly preempted it in the abstract in the poster, but uh, that, that can't be helped. And then I shall end up with what I find 
the biggest surprise of all and the newest. And I'd be very intrigued to see what you make of that. So I'm going to start. Um, can we lower the lights? Because I, I haven't any notes. There's no need. <laughs> It, it doesn't matter, but it, it means if somebody wants to go to sleep, I won't be able to see them do so. <laughs> well, not to worry, not to worry, as long as, it's, as, long as that is, uh, the image is clear. I, I want to start with a, a series of projects and the common element um, is that they're all in Northern Britain. Northern Britain is a sort of politically correct term, which means Northern England and Scotland, um, and avoids, avoids nationalist problems. Uh, so I'm talking about field work I've carried out. Uh, no, don't, don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> um, over quite a long time, and the curious way in which the results seem to have grown together, seem to coalesce in a way that I certainly had not predicted. And that's why I'm not starting by summarizing a range of theoretical ideas that quite frankly, I did not have in my mind when we started. Uh, they are emerging as so often happens from the surprises of the work itself. I want to start with one of the most remote places I've worked, and also perhaps uh, not for, because of me, but one of the better known. And this is um, the Great Langdale near the axe quarries. These are the biggest supplier of stone axes in the British Isles by a long chalk. Um, one of the most prolific sources anywhere in Europe, and most significant for our purposes, the highest archaeological monuments in England which makes me feel rather idiotic for doing three years excavation on top of that. But it did work and indeed with climate change that those sites are now so inaccessible that we can do little more. But I don't want to talk about um, the axis so much as the mountain and most specifically the history of that mountain. Uh, one preliminary, there is a Langdale uh, Neolithic axe, um, one of the few that survives with its half, and a series of radiocarbon dates. Some of them are obtained very recently simply because smaller samples can now be dated than when we worked there in the 1980s. And it does show two things that axe production was very early, it comes with the first settlement of the upland landscape. And it stops much sooner than we thought. It's a much shorter period than we believed. That's interesting. It also suggests that the decision to you to exploit really remote and dangerous upland locations for their stone in England is happening at just the point when the same process is coming to an end in the Southern Alps. And that is not such a strange uh, correlation to make because alpine axes are in fact distributed throughout the British Isles, uh, mostly in England and Scotland, fewer in Wales and fewer in Ireland. So maybe, if you like, the, this is these are the English Alps, the so-called Lake District. Now there is a view of the the site itself. The Excavations took place, I hate to think, did I get vertigo looking at my own slides? They were on a 75 degree slope on a series of ledges, primarily here. But what I'm concerned with is not actually that, it is this. At the bottom of the mountain, um, and I will just show you, uh, I'm talking about here, the bottom of the mountain, with a clear view towards those peaks, and this is uh, Harrison Stickle, Loth Crag and Pike Stickle, which you've just seen is behind there. There are two massive glacial boulders with a post medieval wall in between them. They are like a portal leading into the lowland valley. Sorry, I, yeah. And on that portal, there is rock art, which is Interesting in itself, although rock art is one of those subjects that does make people into fanatics, and I don't want to do that, because the point I want to make is that that is not normal 
petroglyphs, not normal rock art in, in a British or indeed an Atlantic landscape. That is megalithic art, and its best parallels are in massive monuments, the megalithic tombs we call passage tombs or passage graves. We excavated there a few years ago, um, finding a stone platform attached to the bottom of the carving. It was clearly Neolithic because behind it, there were fresh carvings which uh, had been concealed when it was built. And within its material were actually the tools for making the images. The rear side of the rock wasn't decorated, but it had been it had been flaked. You, you can see this is, I think this is the biggest core in England. But interestingly, what did they do with the flakes? They took them round to the opposite side of the rock and they buried them at the foot of the carving. They either laid them flat or they pushed them down vertically into that platform. Strange behavior. Well, here, here we see the, the excavation. This is the pl pl platform conceiving art. This is the exposed art. That's a separate panel. Where do we find parallels to this? Well, a much better known monument called Newgrange, um, north of Dublin. And in fact, the material we, we were observing has no real context within the, within the island of Britain. It is Irish. And that's not terribly surprising given that many of the products of those quarries had gone to Ireland in a previous generation. But at the time, those carvings are, are, were made, if we take the radiocarbon dates to Newgrange, that quarry, those quarries are already ancient monuments being referenced by an exotic style of carving. That's nice, but I think we can go further. What we're looking at at the, uh, the British site, which is called Cop Howe, by the way, is a passage between two completely natural glacial boulders which has the same attributes and the same designs as the built passages in some of the biggest Neolithic monuments in Western Europe, and particularly the, the biggest ones in Ireland, as for example, here at Newgrange. That's nice, and you might, you might uh, try to pursue that line, but one of the surprises that came up, um, and all these projects through surprises was the recognition that the midsummer sunset actually sets into the axe quarries, the already old sites of the axe quarries, as viewed through that particular portal. And it's just thinking that what was it about that site? Can we just call it a natural place? Or was it a place that was used as if it was a monument? And indeed, in terms of the movement of light, uh, one side of that portal was decorated more than the other, following exactly the same conventions as all the Irish tombs at the same date. It raised a question in our minds about how we, how we define monuments. And that's an important question because, as in most um, heritage um, management organisations, protection of ancient monuments does exactly what the name suggests. It is directed to monuments. And historically, much of the 20th century has been devoted to the process of distinguishing those structures built by people which can be protected from things that might look like them that are not, which are not protected, which are geology, which are natural history, but are not prehistory. And it raises some serious problems. And most of our excavations of monuments, and I'll show you the that it were in that traditional framework, the idea of defining types more accurately, and particularly in Scotland, uh, dating them more accurately. And one of the surprises I had was all my Neolithic monuments. And I've been excavating them since 1994. Not one of them has been Neolithic yet. Uh, they have all been unexpectedly other periods, normally early Bronze Age. But that was a traditional agenda, but as a byproduct of that traditional agenda, we started to notice things that worried us. Well, here is a, a real ancient monument. This is, in fact, the earliest railway viaduct in Scotland over the River Eyre at a place called Ballock Mile. But, and it's got a spectacular red sandstone cliff. Just by the viaduct, a feeder stream enters 
that enters the river. And again, we have a cliff, a red sandstone cliff. Now, I should say that most petroglyphs, most rock art, certainly 95% of all rock art in Britain and Ireland is on flat surfaces. So this stands out, apart from being a spectacular show, even more so because, again, those motifs shouldn't be in Scotland. If you want to find parallels, again, you have to look inside Irish tombs, not just for those motifs, which is a slightly traditional typological exercise, but also for the grammar by which they are articulated with each other to create a, a whole panel, a whole design or, or set of designs. Uh, the cliff has a very distinct orientation, as you, as you can see from, from this uh, 3D image. But curiously, when it's been recorded, and it's been recorded very thoroughly um, using a variety of technologies, the one thing that no one's asked is, well, well, what is that orientation? It is, in fact, exactly the same. There is, um, sorry, there is, here is the cliff. This is the skyline profile, but it's the midwinter sunset. Now, I have to say, I can't show a colour picture of this because the viaduct has been built long after the Neolithic blocks the view. But a digital reconstruction by Aaron Watson shows the sun descending on December the 21st into this valley, precisely in line with that cliff. Now, it stands to reason nobody builds a cliff Nobody built a cliff, they found a cliff. They did not put those marks on the, on the rock to establish a calendar or to predict when, uh, when midwinter would come. Rather, people noticed something they couldn't explain and thought was worth, was notable and interesting and remarkable. And they celebrated that. They probably celebrated it at midwinter. But again, here is a cliff which does the same sorts of things as an Irish tomb. And, it need, and it's worth saying that 20% of all Irish passage graves, tombs with, with decoration, have solstitial alignments built into them. So how do we distinguish natural places from what I'm calling found architecture? I want to show you another site, a very well-known site in the Outer Hebrides, Kalanish. Um, I, I spent some time there this, this summer, um, actually for a completely different project. And I went there mostly, mostly because I wanted to incorporate in the paper about uh, navigation and maritime archaeology. I'm not going to talk about that at all, because when I got there, I, I felt that what I'm looking at just does not fit what I'm meant to be reading about this monument. Now, let me explain the components um, in this image. A sloping ridge coming up to a massive rock outcrop. At the end of the north end of the outcrop, there is a huge rock. And leading up to it is a line, double line usually, of standing stones into which is set an exceptionally well preserved and high, tall circle of monoliths. Now, this has played a part in archaeological literature ever since a man called Alexander Tom, uh, the archaeoastronomer, moored his yacht in, uh, in the calm water uh, below Kalanish because he, he was having too much problem with Atlantic storms. When the moon rose, he saw the standing stones and he became obsessed. And ever since then, um, Kalanish has been taken over, I guess, by archaeoastronomers. But it's been essentially an archaeology of structures, of built elements that has been discussed. Here we see the, the central part of, of the monument. Uh, I just point out the avenue running from north to south continues. Here's a straight line, single line, stone circle, inside it a megalithic tomb, fine, running along the apex of the ridge and running out where the National Monument ends. You go through a gate, you're out of the monument. But if you went a little further, something strange happens because outside the National Monument is this. 
This is a completely natural cave. It's uh, called Notan Terso, which in Gallic means the Hill of Sorrows. It contains Neolithic material, contains a series of hearths, but it is not. it was not built. But it does resemble, and resembles very strongly indeed, um, a chamber too. There were no human remains in it. I have to say the excavation has never been properly published, but we know enough about that. The entire avenue is not aligned on the stone circles, the books say. It is aligned on this purely geological feature, which is not even included in the National Monument, and then strictly speaking receives no legal protection because it isn't a monument. But as you can see in the left hand half, it, a massive avenue uh, comes towards it. That's one end and this is the other end. Now, it happens, or maybe it's deliberate, that at midsummer uh, the sun rises and crosses the sky at, at it, sorry, the sun is at its height over the crest of that ridge. But much more interesting in the summer, a blade of light comes through the roof and comes out of that chamber. It's called, called a sun dagger. It was noticed by some amateur archaeologists, but uh, everybody's seen it, except I'm afraid of my, myself. I was there at the wrong I was, I was there at the wrong time of day. But uh, people whose judgment I trust, uh, if only because they're the scourge of uh, fantasies, have observed it themselves. I think here again, the missing term of the equation is precisely the feature which initially sets up the importance of this site, which is then increasingly elaborated and, and celebrated through the addition of architectural features. But it is it is the mystery of the behavior of the sun in relation to something that looks rather like a chamber tomb. That's what starts it. And if I can just go back for a moment, um, with the eye of fantasy, my fantasy, the profile of this more ridge with a chamber here is pictured on a huge scale, exactly the same profile as Neolithic long cairns in this region of Scotland. One wonders whether there is also an element of people believing that these these are not just natural wonders but might be actual buildings built by unknown people at some time in the past it's impossible to say uh, but it's it's worth raising the question uh, i won't go into the sequence at kalanish which in any case is disputed but it is kind of interesting to i think that the last phase is is the erection of the stone circle which in a sense provides a baffle, provides a barrier to people approaching that cave. They need to go round that circle. And in fact, and I won't go into detail, in a prescribed movement because of various obstacles found by excavation. And in its final phase, another chambered tomb, but a real one is built inside it, which makes the progress down that avenue to the Nocantursa, the natural cave, actually impractical, it blocks the way. So here we have a piece of architecture, a monument if you want to call it that, and it has a radiocarbon date about 2500 BC. In my view, replacing or supplementing or mimicking what we would say is a geological feature, which nonetheless was recognized to have special properties. And without those special properties, I don't believe there would be a monument complex there. And since on the island of Lewis, there are only two tourist destinations for people coming in cruise liners, it still has a magic today. Um, one of the problems is taking photographs without, without uh, those busloads of people. So here, here we have another of these intermediate cases where maybe architecture is referring to things that we think are natural, maybe it's referring to things that we think are problematical, which wouldn't be explicable without recourse to the methods of modern science, they'd be explained in other terms. Possibly also um, a notion that the people who built what archaeologically we can classify and protect as the monument, they, are, they themselves believed in the antiquity of those locations and thought believe they could see a human presence in the material in the material configuration of that site the particular rock outcrop and and cave of, of the hill of sorrows 
Now, I want to develop this with, uh, with, with some sites we looked at, at in a valley in the southern highlands of Scotland, Strath Tay. Um, I'm, going, I'm not talking about all the um, places on, on, on this slide, but a number of them I'll, I'll point out. Um, there's Ben Laws, which is uh, a, an upland ridge with rock art. There's Croft Morag, or, uh, which is a stone circle, uh, previously excavated by Stuart Piggott. And there's Erlar, uh, which is another rock art site. Um, though we never intended to do a systematic study of Strath Tay, in fact, that had been done by Professor John Coles in the 1960s. After we looked at the first site, the whole region seemed so peculiar, we felt we ought to try to, to, uh, to get a, a grip on places which were apparently well known, but were beginning, were beginning to raise problems. So I, I'll take you through. Ben Laws. Ben Laws is one of the higher ridges in the Scottish Highlands. Um, it overlook, overlooks uh, Loch Tay, one of the longest bodies of inland water in, in Scotland. Um, and I want just to make two points with this slide. All the evidence for built monuments, not many of them, and for domestic settlement in early prehistory is in the area which is still cultivated, still cultivated, mostly still grazed. That is here. At this height, um, you can't see it in this image, there is a post-medieval and medieval wall which separated year-round land use from summer pasture. And I, mean, I know this is something familiar here. There are plenty of remains of shields um, above, that, above that wall. And in that area, there are numerous, uh, really numerous outcrops with rock art. I mean, it's partly, I have to say, due to one man, George Curry, who uh, is better known as a rock guitarist, who, uh, who just is the rock art hound of Scotland. He, he, can't, he can't go for a walk without finding new sites. He's, uh, he, he's, uh, he's found over 700 of them, and they're all real. But also, um, it is on one of the great cross, uh, cross um, upland routes linking the North Sea and the Irish Sea. The other point I want to make, and I, I, I haven't really got an illustration of it from this distance, is that the rock art not only focuses on this intermediate level that was grazed in summer in the medieval and post-medieval period, it focuses towards very dramatic waterfalls. Uh, I don't have a picture of that, uh, but if you work there, you become well aware of it, even as the logistics of getting from site to site. It, it, it is an inexplic inexplicable and dramatic phenomenon. And there are many of them, some of them are tourist attractions. When I say there are a lot of rock art sites and, and not too many monuments, this is what I mean. Here you see, distribution of rock art and in amongst that you have a very small number of monuments you have uh, a megalithic tomb you have um, the odd stone circle but nothing very much more than that it's essentially a, a distinction between areas which even on modern landscape are only settleable uh, in the summer months and seasonal settlement higher uh, going higher up indeed for what it's worth the rock art on Biden Laws goes to a greater elevation than anywhere else in, in the British Isles. I draw your attention to one other feature, which I'll come back to. Uh, Loch Tay it really has three sections. Two are more or less east-west, and one for Clean is northeast to southwest. It's observable, and there's been field work to check the absences. The rock art only overlooks this central section. And that's something that becomes interesting as we proceed. Uh, we excavated around us a series of these carvings. Uh, they, they're in very shallow sheltered basins. And one of the strangest experiences we had was trying to map the sheltered basins, because even LIDAR would not pick up the minor details topography. So we found a very fit student and he would run to 
the point, the, the horizon as seen from the rock art, at which point we'd phone him on his mobile and he'd, he'd take the coordinates. We managed to map the whole, the whole site in 45 minutes. Um, and that was essentially mapping the, the edge of visibility from the rock art, but more important, the edge of the area of shelter from pervading winds, which simply cannot be picked up by, by, uh, by more expensive and more elaborate techniques. Um, I think it's the only time I've ever done anything you know, called, called archaeological science. It was great fun. Actually, that's not quite true because we also had pollen stratified with the rock carvings that showed they were in, in an open landscape, which had been, been cleared. Indeed, a landscape very like the one you see in these images. Now, we tried to be explicit about this distinction between cultural and natural phenomena, despite obviously the reservations and that particular use of language, in that we excavated around decorated rocks and undecorated rocks, which, since this was a community project using local volunteers, was quite difficult because uh, the, the person who did this beautiful excavation around this rock could not understand why we were so pleased he found nothing and he simply could not get he simply could not get hold of the idea that he was the control sample there were no artifacts whatever around this rock there is no decoration on it uh, the others all to some extent had decoration and there were artifacts but even then it was not straightforward the artifacts were nearly always quartz some of them were broken hammers. Some of them were just broken fragments of quartz. They certainly correlated with the rocks that were decorated, embellished, and not with the others where they were completely absent. But the quantity of broken hammer stones did not match the amount of, of work on the rocks themselves, nor did it uh, match the hardness of the rocks. What we found instead was that the rocks that when the hit shine, the, uh, their sparkle had all the attention and that a great deal of the activity had been battering rock to make it shine and not specifically to create motifs. The rock that was hardest and had the densest motifs had fewest hammer stones uh, and it doesn't shine. There are, there are two types. There. So there was something strange going on. Even stranger is the fact that this entire complex is overlooked by a standing stone, a men here, if you like, except that it is entirely glacial origin, and when excavated, um, more frustrated diggers, I'm afraid, they could not understand why I was so pleased that there was absolutely no archaeological material associated with it. It is, again, something that has been found, not something that's been placed there. Now, in the course of, of, of the project, we were able to investigate um, a number of rocks which were partly vegetated. Uh, this one's particularly interesting because it's almost like a little enclosure um, and was full of artifacts, mostly quartz again. That's just another view of it. And indeed, a, a series of very faint um, images which can only be seen when wet and in sunlight. Now, that in itself might be a curiosity, but the major thing is they sparkle. They are the type of rock which has this property. And we don't really have, I don't know, we don't really have an archaeological concept of sparkly monuments or sparkly places. But that's what we're talking about. When we look at the positioning of those rocks, it becomes even more intriguing. Um, you've seen that image already. This is the view from that hollow that I've just shown you. It not only looks straight along the length of loch that runs from northeast to southwest, it points quite specifically at where the midsummer sun rises, which is here. And basically, Loch Tay, or the straight section with all the rock art, um, is aligned with the solstices, the midsummer sunrise, the midwinter sunset. Now, this may be coincidence. I can't claim it, it, it's not an alignment like Stonehenge marked by a, a row of earthworks or a line, a line of monoliths, but it is observable and it's been observed by many people. Again, it's not a question of 
astronomy or of trying to predict events, build a calendar, work out when to sow your crops. You really you need to carve a rock to find that out. You're not much use as a farmer. No, surely, again, it's a case of people, people in an open landscape noticing things that they felt were puzzling, significant, of which they had no explanation in the terms that we use today, which might be called cosmology, is might be called astronomy, uh, had to interpret them in terms that were meaningful to themselves. And some of that, uh, some of those explanations would be closer to what we call cosmology. So Ben Laws is interesting because there is not a monument there. There are no monuments. The standing stone is natural. Um, the rock, the rock art are uh, is natural. Uh, consists of geological surfaces that have been treated, but they have been selected. They have been found, and to my mind, they have been used as if as if they were architecture. Now we move into one of the side valleys, Erlar. Now um, I have to acknowledge here that my co-excavator uh, Aaron Watson, a former student, came up with the really important idea long before I'd have thought of it. We went there to excavate another rock art site um, for an agenda which has nothing to do with this talk. He pointed out that as you approached the site, didn't it look awfully like a Neolithic long barrow, a long burial barrow? Same orientation, same profile, same dimensions. And indeed, it's not clear in this image, rising to a, a peak at one end with a large flat stone that looked like the cover of a chamber. It is quite right. When someone else points it out, you can't, can't stop noticing it. But our point is, is different. The uh, apparent top of that chamber is a natural outcrop. There is no burial chamber. There is no burial. and There's nothing Neolithic on the site. What there is, is a, a badly damaged um, outcrop. Here, here it is, uh, decorated with images, which I would would date to the early Bronze Age, I wouldn't it? I wouldn't at home because I'd be told there is no chronology, but I think I think I could argue it, but it would take all night. At any rate, it's not Neolithic. Uh, I, I, I'll I'll settle for that. Now the outcrop is a prominent feature and does command a an impressive view. Interestingly, you can't see it there, but here is one of the great tourist attractions of this region. The books of Aberfeldy, a massive set of cataracts, again the same relationship. But also, here in, in this simulation by Aaron, um, the alignment of the images and the, the rock face is towards the midsummer sun. Sorry, midwinter sunrise. And that's a big crucial mistake to make because basically it's so cold and snowy up there, I've never been up there to spot it at the right time. Uh, be all right if it was midsummer. It's midwinter sunrise. Again, people have noticed things, or maybe also I believe, and have acted accordingly. Uh, they have embellished those rocks. Uh, we carried out an excavation on the mound. There is the putative chamber. Well, clearly it's not a chamber. Uh, and what did we find? Well, all sorts of strange things. The rock outcrop had been quarried in part. Uh, for example, here we have the removal of alternating boulders from the outcrop to create, create um, almost a curve, dog tooth pattern on a curve. It had also been quarried in that people had dug into the natural quartz veins in the rock and extracted large pieces of quartz, which they then didn't use, they reburied them. It's the same practice as we saw with that first example, the decorate, the largest core in England, if you like. Um, there is something going on there which certainly is arcane and quartz as so often seems to be one of the components. I, I'm not going to speculate on why, but uh, there it is. And on completion of the excavation, it became clear that artifacts have been pushed into the rock outcrop, usually at significant points in the natural pattern of fracture. They've been pushed into the fissures, they've been pushed into the joints between, between them, different planes, and they included the tools, chisels and hammers for making the art itself. 
It also became clear, partly from documentary evidence, partly from our excavation, that the last stage in this process was finally to build the monument. Uh, I have to say most of the evidence is documentary because we, we know it's been removed, but essentially a Bronze Age can was put not over the so-called capstone, but at the other end of the monument. Um, there's not much left of it, but detailed study of the stonework here, as opposed to the stone littering the monument, shows that this, the, this material had been brought in. There is the apparent um, curb. Um, I think the other things don't, don't really matter. It is essentially looks like a megalithic tomb. It's treated like a megalithic tomb. It's reused in the way that many megalithic tombs in that region were reused in the early Bronze Age, including the erection of a can. But until that can was built, there was no monument. Again, it was treated as if it were one and as if it were ancient and acknowledging that it played, its place in topography was significant in relation to the movement of the sun. And forgive me for keeping mentioning the movement of the sun. It's not that I'm obsessed with it, but at least it is measurable. We can, it, it involves fewer leaps of faith than most things because the sun still behaves in the same way. Now, uh, the third of the monuments in that region, Croft Morag, uh, excavated exceptionally well in the 1960s by Stuart Pickett and Derek Simpson. Um, and the only reason I went there, a um, very traditional agenda, was that they didn't they, they didn't collect any charcoal because it was too small for dating. Yes, it's so themselves in the excavation report. And the pottery was contentious. They dated it the early Neolithic. Some of it is, but most of it appears to be very late, probably middle Bronze Age. I wrote a paper with Alison Sheridan suggesting this got us into terrible trouble because those Scottish archaeologists who were interested completely disagreed with us, were all with each other. And finally, the only thing to do is to go back to the state monument, reopen the 1965 trenches and collect the charcoal from the bulk and see what happened. Until that point on the pottery evidence, this was the earliest stone circle in Britain. I have to say to my embarrassment, it's now the latest. <laughs> and the difference is not a thousand years, it's two thousand years. The sighting is interesting. Um, it's not overlooking the Liver Tay exactly. Um, it's at the foot of Shehalion. You see it there and again here, which is a volcanic mountain, which in Scottish law is the central point of the whole of, the, of northern Scotland. And in terms of Gaelic place names, is the sacred mound of the, the sacred mountain of the Caledonians. It is the feature that overlooks the site, dominates the view for very great distance around. But that was not why we started the project. We went there to get, collect charcoal samples. But it became clear that that was not really the right way to think about the site. First of all, there, was the, uh, the, there were two points. One was that the stone circle was on, on an earthwork. It was claimed in 1965, it was on a built platform. I, in fact, I think, in fact, well, in fact, it was not. It was built on a glacial mound, but it, it was built on an earthwork. It was just not an earthwork that had been built by, by humans. The second point is that that mound had a spectacular glacial erratic buried visibly in its upper surface, and you'll see that in a moment. It was, a, it was just a type of rock that didn't occur anywhere else in the area. And from that point, from that central point, yet another solstitial alignment, the mid midsummer, goodness, the midsummer sunset can be observed as the sun passes behind Shehalion. Now, why was the early Neolithic pottery on that mound when nothing else happened for 2,000 years? I suspect it's because initially it was just a natural phenomenon that someone had observed, perhaps on one occasion they left some Neolithic pots, and it was observed again and it was enhanced. So, I mean, how was it enhanced? It was enhanced by building a stone circle around that completely natural erratic and then 
subsequently shaping the mound and reshaping the stone circle. But th those are details. It's the relationship that set it off. And I think it set it off early. Otherwise, it's very difficult to see why you should get an infant pottery just, just there and nowhere else around. Here is um, an old excavation photo. This is the central feature of the entire site. This is, comes from the archive in 1965. It's glacially erratic. Uh, interestingly, it's actually had flakes taken off it. And in the excavation report, it had a fire lit next to it. It was scrubs a half, but I'm afraid no charcoal survived when we re-excavated. Here, here it is. Um, th this is the bulk between two 1965 excavations. Uh, this is the stone exposed here at the flakes. And they did not occur naturally. Uh, I, I took me half an hour with a sledgehammer to remove any more material from them. Um, and this is this extraordinary banded orange boulder, which was originally, and I, I know this is I know this from someone who dug on the site, originally thought to be part of the monument. This is rather telling. When it was excavated first, it was believed the mound was a platform. This stone was part of the monument. But when the stone was lifted, uh, and nothing was found. It was plopped back and never mentioned in the excavation report at all. Um, but there's a lovely old lady whose name I can't remember at the moment, who dug there as a student and was very annoyed by this procedure and appeared that it had acted with mine, well, it would be 40 years after the excavation and said, I always disagreed, now, now I can tell you the story. And I have every reason to believe her because she, she wrote some distinguished papers of her own in later life. She was a good scholar. Um, just to emphasize a few of those points, here is the mound trimmed. It is a glacial mound. Uh, we can reconstruct the form of the stone circle. We know the heights of the stones, but some of them have fallen. The common feature is that they're graded by height. They, they are lowest to the northeast, highest to the southwest, a common feature. Um, it's supposed to be peculiar to parts of Scotland, most of said people have never been to Stonehenge, which is actually the best example of this. Uh, the other, the uh, other point is that the mound had actually been reshaped in prehistory when the stones were put in. They shaved the mound so that it was steeper on one side than the other, and uh, the, the, that it rises in height uh, towards the, uh, towards the northeast. And what happens to the northeast? Well, well you, in a sense, you've seen it before. Um, that is literally the, the solstice. Um, as the sun passes behind Shehalion, which lights up like an active volcano. Now, my point is that Crocmorag is a state monument, a famous monument. It, it may have been redated so far as its monoliths go, but that doesn't really matter. But the key elements there are precisely the elements that were not highlighted or not even recognized in 1960 excavation. That excavation took place to prepare the, uh, prepare the presentation of the monument to the public. And as part of an agenda, which was to distinguish the main types of Scottish monuments from features in the landscape, which could be explained away as geological. And it is those features that actually determine the entire layout of that site and the way it operated. And that's really what I mean by found architecture or places, or places becoming monuments. Now, I want to just generalize from those examples because there are a number of points I could make. Now, first one is that I haven't talked about the whole of British prehistory. Um, I've talked about a period which extends from the Neolithic to the early, perhaps the Middle Bronze Age. Let, let's say at an extreme 4000 BC to 1500, both in exact. Then these phenomena, such as I described, do not occur in later prehistory. We have places that are treated as special very frequently but mainly by being selected for offerings, for hoards, for, for deposits of metal work. And that's a tradition that had already been present with stone axes from the Neolithic. It is an earlier prehistoric phenomenon with a specific temporality and it doesn't always happen. 
If we look at the context of the examples I've used, which are all Northern British, they're almost all from areas that have not been settled much before. Now, I have to be careful because many of these areas do have Mesolithic activity, but there is always a substantial hiatus before the time that these places become significant, are treated as significant. The one that is earliest at Langdale is interesting because there is no Mesolithic, at least known so far, anywhere in the central mountains uh, of that region. So it really is people moving into an unknown and uh, upland landscape. Very often they're areas that have not been seen sedentary settlements and are being used intermittently and seasonally. Ben Law's uh, uh, pollen um, suggesting upland pasture would be an example. So that they're not, uh, you do, they are not a phenomenon that's uniformly spread through time or space. They're, they're early and they're in areas that are, I don't want say marginal, but intermittently employed. And sometimes areas that haven't been settled before. They're not a feature of later, more sedentary occupation. Without exception, these places, and there are many more of them, are associated with phenomena which people in the past would have been unable to explain in the terms that we use today, because those are the terms of post-Renaissance and post-Enlightenment science. I've used the example of the sun, not because it's the only one, but the dog. Because, as I said before, the sun does behave in a predictable fashion, so it's possible to make an extrapolation from, let us say, the sunset at Shihalia. You can back project it, and then it's less than a degree different. It does, the visual effect isn't different, isn't significantly altered. I've also mentioned uh, the association, as we see it, between rock art and dramatic waterfalls. And you could, you could think of other examples, certainly springs would, would, would be a, an example. Phenomena which raise questions, think, phenomena need explanation. We find them straightforward because we believe we have the explanation. Uh, but they are phenomena that make certain places stand out from other places. There are also locations which could be interpreted, and this is an inference, as having a distant past which could not be explained. That is to say, natural mounds, in our terms, geological mounds, that resembled long barrows and would be difficult to distinguish from them. And if you talk to the heritage authorities in Scotland, they've had a terrible time protecting monuments and unprotecting them and then protecting them again. Uh, uh, as, the, as the dialogue between field archaeologists and, and field geologists has shifted, it isn't a straightforward matter. So there are hints of a past. Um, how we interpret them, I don't know. But the notion that certain places had a history which is lost, but at, at any rate, raise a question. And that question, of course, is the, is the question where we began. Do we really believe that people in the early Bronze Age uh, were perfectly able to distinguish between nature and culture in the way that 20th century field archaeologists found so difficult? Of course we don't. And I think that grey area is, is interesting. And I think one possibility, and it is not, uh, it, it's in, imponderable, is that the continuities that we might want to claim are, are the invisible ones of place names. Now I, I don't. I know a little about um, Scottish, the Irish place names, and certainly uh, again some that some about river names. Many of our of the names that we still use go back to the earliest possible sources, and they're at least two thousand years old. And they last. They last in a way that um, we simply don't. We we simply don't find with with, with field evidence. Give one example and one example only. Silbury Hill, the largest artificial mound in Neolithic Europe, is at the source of the River Kennet. 
We don't know what the word cannot means, but we do know the Roman town downstream is called Cunitio. It's the same word. And this is to, this is two millennia, and it could it could be that name goes even further back. There are imponderables like that. And uh, the example I, I'd use, uh, which I haven't illustrated because it's really a different, a different talk, is the persistent use of certain lengths of river to make offerings, which are separated in terms of typology, chronology, by centuries. And where, and in places where, at least to our eyes, we can see nothing that distinguishes those strings, lengths of river from other places. Other, there are no phenomenon like a waterfall. Maybe place names are, are a missing term of the equation. I think one way of looking at much of this evidence, to think in terms of people coming into an unfamiliar landscape, not necessarily one that's never been settled before, but one that's not been settled in the immediate past and the one that is not fully understood. And in the process of doing that, having to come to terms with play, with phenomena that raise problems. And one way of doing so is by giving special attention to them. If you like appeasing the powers that are associated with them, celebrating those powers, eventually turning some of them into monuments of kinds that we are, as archaeologists, more, com more comfortable with. But of course, that raises another problem. And that is the one I began with. How do we protect and display the physical remains of the past if, if we have a disciplinary history of trying to separate things built by people from other features of the landscape, which may have been just as significant to people, but which do not have obvious signatures? Now, I've cheated in a sense because I've obviously used examples of places which do have archaeology. But for instance, Croft Moray, Croft Moran, gave you the pronunciation is disputed. That glacial mound with that erratic and the early Neolithic pottery, no one would ever have excavated there except for there being a stone circle. How many more of these are there? We don't know. Well, at this point, I, I, it was a year ago, I felt comfortable that we are looking at a, a, a series of phenomena which we, we could deal with, and particularly um, phenomena related to the reoccupation of, of upland landscapes within Britain. But as it says, there are surprises. Now, I want to end with a recent project unpublished at, uh, in the English Lake District. Um, the topography feature itself, these are wild mountains. The, uh, the axe quarry is here, but I'm talking about sites that are mostly over 700 meters uh, above sea level. Where, and a number of people have been discovering a new class of phenomenon. Let's not call them monuments, that preempts discussion. Boulders, primarily, which have been in turned into cairns, which have enclosures attached to them, and which which have been treated as if they were monuments, but the boulders being the primary element. Now, I was persuaded a year ago by the people who've been finding them, and I should say at the moment, there are over a hundred of these monuments, which have been surveyed and never excavated. I was persuaded to excavate one. Now, the selection process was totally un unscientific. I won't say how old I am, but they did. And they said, well, most of the sites are two hours walk, like two hours time before you start digging. Uh, you've been retired for a little while, but there is one you might look to, with, uh, to look at. It's in a pass with a dual carriageway and a bus stop, and it takes 10 minutes to get to it. So we did in fact uh, look at that monument, uh, Dunmail Range. But just to give you the phenomenon, uh, one of the people I work with, Peter Style, here is a plan of one of these phenomena, a little attached enclosure, but the main thing is a bin, is, is a bond. Now, I don't think there's been any doubt about the date of this phenomenon, and indeed the book on British Britain and Ireland that Gavin quoted actually has a photograph of one of them in the Bronze Age chapter, unfortunately. Uh, they are found in areas that also have Bronze Age uh, cairns with 
documented burials. It's a perfectly reasonable proposition. They're, they're, they sh and we know from particularly environmental evidence that the uplands of this region are recolonized, resettled in the early Bronze Age, which would be just the right time. So it was a very simple matter of doing a small excavation simply to show that this was a real phenomenon and to look for dating evidence. It couldn't have been simpler. The location was in a dramatic mountain pass, but as you see, not very far from a bus stop. Um, and at the head of the pass, um, just here, is a massive and undisputed early Bronze Age care of a type that occurs in mountain passes. In Britain. So it, it seemed to be a reasonable, uh, a reasonable example to work on. But there were there was a curious thing that um, it's called Dunmail Rays, and the cairn is Dunmail's cairn. Because Dunmail, in local legend, was a Norse king who was killed in a battle there. And there is, and again, it, it is actually um, celebrated in a mock saga written by an English poet, uh, W.G. Collingwood. Um, who, who ended ended the saga with the battle of Dunmail, raised in the death the death of King Dunmail? Well, we immediately shrugged off any, any antiquarian thing, and we knew where we were. We had no problem. Here's the monument. Um, you see, it isn't too inaccessible. Uh, spread of boulders and a large glacial erratic. On excavation, it came clear that it, it had a platform attached with a curb, and on further excavation, it became clear it was an annexed enclosure with an entrance, which was then filled in to create a platform. We even had a piece of work to fill in. We couldn't really ask better than that, could we? Yes, <laughs> three radiocarbon dates of three completely different contexts, all on young charcoal. This relates to a completely different phase in the settlement of the in British uplands. The, these are the dates, approximate dates, because it is disputed of the first Viking settlement of the uplands of precisely the region we were in. And uh, that is based mostly on place name evidence, which I'm not uh, an expert on, so I, I can't be too dogmatic. But essentially we can't given the context, given the samples, and given the record of the lab, we cannot talk this away. Nor can we say the other hundred sites are going to, going to date from uh, the first millennium AD. But it raises an interesting problem. It also raises an interesting problem because if this relates instead to the resettlement of the uplands, the annexing, the celebration, the enhancing of physical features that were considered significant in the process of settlement. It, it brought my mind to uh, this occasion where I'm in the lecture on an island which was settled not at exactly the same time, but close to the same time. And I just wonder if this is a phenomenon, this celebration of topographical features, which might be investigating other cases where land is freshly settled. And obviously Iceland is the key example. So I leave you with thy surprise and my puzzlement because somehow I've got, I or the others have got to do those long walks and, and, and sample some more before we can be comfortable. But it is a massive coincidence that we should be digging in a valley which has this legendary association with, with the Viking raids and produce carbon dates, which are, are consistent. I mean, it's, it's never going to be exact. And I don't think we can really argue it away by saying we have one piece of work flint when there is a big Bronze Age can so close by anyway. So there, I think I, I shall leave it. Um, we've gone from found objects, as in modernist art, the incorporation of objects in, in an assemblage, um, as for example, in this um, collage by Kurt Schwitters, to a variety of phenomena which raise problems. I think those problems are worth discussing. Uh, although 
I do stress they came they came to the fore not because of incredible sophisticated theoretical thinking about culture and nature, but because a whole series of my field projects went subtly wrong or at least threw up threw up surprises. And it's out of the dialogue, of course, between general ideas of, uh, about culture, about nature, about landscape, and the realities of field investigations, however small scale, that maybe there is an agenda, and that agenda I'm going to call found architecture. Thank you. So, oh, I have time for questions, observation, and follow.